and you're live now. Thank you very much, Jill. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our meeting of the... I'll try that again. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Grants Committee meeting uh, for this day, June 21st, 2021. Um, first day of summer. Uh, also, it is National Indigenous Peoples Day. So today, if you're out and about, the uh, new sign is being unveiled at the Peace and Friendship Park. So if you have some time today and uh, check that out, it might be great. So I'd like to call the meeting to order. And in so doing, uh, we'll do the audio and visual check for everyone. So Councillor Trish Purdy, District 4. Good morning, Councillor Daigle Gammon and everyone else. It's great to be here and happy first day of summer and Indigenous Day as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lindell Smith, District 8. Hi, welcome. Hello, Halifax. Lindell Smith, District 8. Can't use words. Sorry, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. And Councillor Lisa Blackburn, District 4, has sent her regrets. Alex Handyside. Hello, good morning. Happy summer solstice. Good morning. Uh, Leona Milne. Hi there, good morning. Good morning. Joseph Allen. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Joseph. Emily Jackson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Emily. Alana Baxter, our vice chair. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. And Stefan Ludin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And we have a, a, a parcel of our staff with us today, which is awesome. So Petra Jane Temple with Finance and Asset Management. Good morning. Good morning, BJ. Um, Tara Legg with Finance and Asset Management as well. Good morning. Good morning. Peter Grecian, did I say that right? Peter, I see that you're muted, but I do see you on the screen. Sorry about that. Hey, yes, good morning. It's Peter Grecian. That's fine. Happy great, to be here. Great. And Bruce Fisher with Finance and Asset Management. Madam Chair, it's uh, Peter Temple. I don't think Mr. Fisher will be joining us. Okay. Um, Trish Higby, Parks and Rec. Uh, good morning, Councillor Michael Ryan. Uh, Trish Higby uh, will not be joining us today. Okay, great. So, Michael Ryan, there you are. Good morning. Good morning. Elizabeth Taylor with Culture and Events. Okay, maybe later. Uh, Sherry Dillman with Parks and Rec. Good morning. I work for Elizabeth Taylor. So if she is not here, I hope to be able to answer any questions. Marvelous. Thank you. Um, Maggie McDonald with Parks and Rec. Nope. Uh, Patricia Hughes, Halifax Transit. Good morning. Good morning, Patricia. Well, thank you. That is our uh, committee members and our staff. And so also welcome to uh, any members of the public that might be joining us or even listening afterwards. So that's our call to order, the approval of the minutes of May 17th, 2021. Any errors or omissions? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes as distributed? So motioned. Alana and a seconder, please. A second. Trish, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion is carried. And I just realized I forgot to call for the question. I'll do better on the next motion. How's that? Um, approval of the order of business and approval of additions or deletions. So may I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Trish? Seconder? Seconded. Alana? You guys are teaming it up today. Great. 
Um, call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed say nay. Hearing none, motion is carried. Business arising out of the minutes, there are none. Call for declaration of conflict of interest. Does anyone feel that they have a conflict of interest to declare? Hearing none. Consideration of deferred business, there is none. Item number seven on our agenda is correspondence, petitions, and delegations. <laughs> Jill, as our legislative assistance, is there any correspondence? We did not receive any correspondence. Thank you. Are there any petitions? Any presentations? Our agenda says none. Information uh, items brought forward, item number eight says that there are none, which brings us to number nine on our agenda, uh, staff reports and item 9.1.1 is less than market value lease, the Royal Life Saving Society Canada, Nova Scotia branch located at 1014 Purcells Cove Road, Halifax. Our staff on this uh, supporting us is Tara Lang. Would someone care to put the motion on the floor for discussion? I will. Thank you, Trish. Seconder, Alex, is that you I saw? I will second. Thank you, Alex. Um, so any discussion on the motion? <clears throat> now, I only have one screen today, so if people would like to raise their hand, then I will be able to see who wishes to speak. No discussion on the motion? Call for the question. Question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carried. Thank you. That was hard work, Tara. Yes, it was. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Item 9.1.2 is less than market value lease agreement, Spencer House Senior Center, 5596 Morris Street, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And the staff supporting us here are Michael Ryan. Yes, Michael Ryan. Um, may I have someone put the motion on the floor, please? So moved. Alex and seconder, please. Stefan? Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, call for the question. Question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Motion is carried. Michael, that was a hard job for you too. Yes, thank you all. No <laughs> questions. <laughs> Item 9.1.3 is Regional Special Events Grant Report 2021-22. Um, and our staff supporting us here are Sherry Dillman. I don't believe Elizabeth Taylor has joined us yet. Um, Sherry, well, perhaps maybe we'll have, um, is there a, a staff report on it, Sherry? Or are you just available to answer any questions or should we have them? Uh, through you, Chair, um, to answer your question. Um, yes, there was a staff report. I believe it was submitted to the committee and I am available to answer any questions that anyone has on the report. Thank you, I apologize, I misspoke. I meant to say a presentation. Oh. So that's okay. So may, uh, may I have someone put a motion on the floor, please? I'll, I'll do it since I have a question. Thank you. Um, it's recommended that the Grants Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council want to approve 41 grant, event grants for a total of uh, 188225 as identified in Table 1 from the approved 
2021-22 operating budget C760 community civic events and to approve 15 event grants for a total of 200,000 as identified in table two, the approved 2021-22 operating budget C764 cultural development uh, funded from the 21-22 community in events preserve Q621. Thank you, Lindell. Is there a seconder? I'll second. Thank you, Joseph. Discussion on the motion, Lindell? Yeah. So understanding, uh, and, this, and this is for, for you, Sherry, so understanding that, that we had some uh, events get money in our last, our last go around, and obviously with COVID-19 and, and things being canceled, some have uh, asked for money again. What, and I hate to say this, but if there's a, there's a uh, point where events are canceled again, um, what, what happens at that point? Um, you're ready there for the yes yeah. yeah through you chair to the counselor um yes uh events have canceled last year who was approved for funding and in cases where they did cancel no funding was released okay and this year to date there has been a few that have canceled. Um, I believe in the report, there were three established community festivals that have canceled already. And since submission of the report, one additional community, established community festival has canceled. So in those cases, no funding will be released. So if we release, how does the, the releasing of the money work? How does that schedule happen? Because this might actually answer my next question. Certainly. Um, once the grants committee, uh, you know, submits the final recommendation to council and council approves, um, we would move forward with event grant agreements to all of the approved organizations to receive funding. Um, so then once that event grant agreement is signed, then we would move forward with releasing the funds. Right. So, okay. So it's, it's nothing, nothing different than usual. So my question is, thinking, say you do all of the usual things, signing the, uh, the agreements and, and, and all the other aspects of getting to that point for the money to be released, you release the money and then they cancel in that agreement. If they don't do the event, they have to give it back, just like any other agreement? Yes, that is correct. Um, we did have one event last year, only one, that received funding and then ultimately ended up canceling and never hosting an event in the last fiscal year. And we did permit, uh, I believe that was a community, a, a community celebration event, a smaller, a smaller grant, and that organization was permitted to use the funds for this fiscal year. Okay. And then that my final question was going to be, is there a leeway to be able to do that? And you, and you just answered yeah. that. So, so great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, counselor. Any other questions? I have a, a question in regards to um, the community events. More so when it comes down to the COVID-19 when Lindell was regarding um, indicating that there is a, a possibility that we may have cancellations again this year um if uh, if things don't work out uh, my question is is there do the committees or do individuals who apply for grants have to have a plan in place if they wish to transition from live events to online um before submitting or like do they have to make that call after you know if, if you know if we go down a lot if we go into the phase of lockdown again um down the line, do they have to make that call then? Or do they have to have a national plan put in place beforehand? Thank you for the question, Joseph. Sherry, off to you again. Thank you, through you, Chair, to the committee member. Um, very, very good question. This year, um, we did recommend that all regional special event grants be approved for in-person events, 
as well as hybrid events who host in person as well as some digital aspect and also to fully fund those events that are 100% virtual. So all three different categories of event hosting because of the uncertainty of the COVID-19 um, requirements regarding in-person events. It is looking like the majority, if not all of the events on, on in table one and table two of the report are moving towards at least some form of an in-person event. Of course, minus the four that have canceled altogether as an online version of that event just isn't possible for those organizations. Oh, great, thank you. Any other questions? Alana. If if uh, the, the full envelope isn't given, what happens to the balance of funds? Thank you, Alana. Sherry? Um, through you, Chair, uh, to the Vice Chair, um, can you clarify that question? If the full envelope, uh, <clears throat> you mean if we do not release grants to an organization, what happens to the remaining? Yep. Yes, that would just go back into into the budget. If I could ask another question. Yes, please. If if that goes back into the budget, is there an opportunity to reallocate those funds in the same fiscal year? So if an organization that was approved for a grant doesn't spend the money, for instance, if they have an in-person event planned, but they have to cancel or they have to cancel part of their proposal. So that money isn't spent. What happens to that money? Like, can it, can it be reallocated elsewhere? Thank you. Great Ryan. question. Um, that is a very great question. In the report is established community festivals and cultural events and showcases. And both of those categories are three year funding, this year being the last year. So in 2019, council did approve X amount of a grant per organization. I can't imagine any more funding being released to those already three year determined amounts of grants to those organizations. Um, for additional regional grants, um, we have community celebrations. That's the last category for this fiscal year. We put, um, we put that the intake on hold just to see how um, the COVID restrictions were going. So that is a possibility. I could discuss that uh, with my manager, Elizabeth Taylor. Um, at the same time, I don't feel we will spend all of the remaining funds of the operational money for those grants in that category. So ultimately I do feel the remaining will go back into the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Any other questions? I have an additional question, if I may. Yes, certainly, Joseph. Thank you. Um, now, I, because we're in this very strange situation where we're all living through COVID, uh, if we do have a situation where an event does cancel, and this kind of goes to speaking to Alana's point, um, if we do have money that does get sent back into the reserve uh, because the event cancels, is there any way, because in my mind is, you know, we're looking at, you know, vaccines are up, we're trying to get, you know, community growth back out there, we're trying to get people you know, established back in the community. Is there any way for us to take those funds and reallocate them to any events that have applied that are on a wait list that are looking for funding? Thank you, Joseph. Um, Sherry, was there anyone that was denied? Or I think that because this was the end of the third year, funding. There were no other requests as I read the report, but Sherry, thank you for answering for us. Yes, thank you again. Um, 
So there is no events on the wait list other than we are opening up the intake for community celebrations uh, on June 30th. So, you know, coming again to the grants committee will be another report regarding just that new intake period. Um, to my knowledge, that would be the only events that are on the list to receive funding. So, so pre-2019, when we granted this three-year funding programs to the established community festivals and the cultural showcases, all those that applied have received funds and will receive funds this fiscal year as shown in table one and table two of, of the report. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering your questions. To our knowledge, there are no additional events on any wait list that aren't receiving funds. Okay, great, thanks. Krish, okay. I see you've got a question. You saw my hand. I saw your hand, Trish. My hand. Um, so I, I hope you can still hear me with the lawnmower in there. But um, so, Sherry, you said that um, community grants are going to be opening on June 30th. I must have missed that in the report. I don't remember seeing that. So does that, so where, where can community, um, uh, communities access this application? Is there a, so, so you're going to be receiving applications for community events come June 30th. How, how can communities access this? Excellent. Through you, Chair, to um, the Councillor. Yes, so on our event grant webpage, um, let's see, it's a long one, halifax.ca, our, our event grant webpage, dash park slash recreation backslash events backslash supporting dash your dash events slash backslash grants. Oh my gosh, that's a long one. On our event grant webpage is where we post all of our applications, deadlines, and information regarding the criteria for each category. So the uh, community celebrations application will be posted, um, what's the date today? Yeah, basically in nine days. Uh, and the deadline for community organizations to apply is, um, two weeks after we post, so July 14th. That's awesome, thank you. Alex, I see that you were next up. Yes, thank you. Um, when staff says that um, the funding for a canceled event goes back um, into uh, the budget, which budget? Is it this committee budget or is it City Hall's general budget? Like, do we still have control over those returned funds or are they lost in City Hall? Sherry, would you like to take that or you want me to try? You, you can go ahead on that one, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and you know, a returning counselor, Councillor Smith might uh, have some information to, to support this, but. I, I believe what happens is that um, it goes back in the, the section of the overall budget that is Parks and Rec. And so not that it is ever lost and not that this committee has a budget per se, because we make the recommendation to regional council. All of these different programs have an allotment of funds that are by request delivered. And should there be um, not all of that budget expended, then it would stay in Parks and Rec as a carry forward if there was a commitment, but it would stay in Parks and Rec. Uh, that envelope, I would believe, uh, Alex, but to be fair, one of the things, Jill, what I might ask of you as our legislative assistant is to, um, for our next meeting, maybe we will have some clarity and we'll put that on the agenda for our next meeting to make sure that there is a a more qualified answer than the one I choose to give you at this moment. How's that, Alex? Thank you, yes. <laughs> Councillor Smith, am I uh, in the right ballpark? Yeah, there's one thing that I would I, I probably correct, but I see Maggie McDonald popped on the screen. So I'll, I'll let Maggie probably give you the answer that I was gonna, the small okay. thing. 
Oh, hi, Maggie. Uh, good morning, Councillor. And my apologies, I'm, I'm a little bit on a split screen here, so I'm looking in one direction. Um, but uh, I find when I move between the office and home, there's a little bit of uh, back and forth. And, and again, my apologies, I heard most of your answer, but there was a large truck driving by, so I didn't get 100% of it. I think, uh, I think you caught most of the points. The, uh, the budget, because it's an operational budget, is allocated to this particular program if the entirety isn't spent, spent, then that would be uh, sort of room within the parks and recreation budget uh, generally. It doesn't, because it's operational, it doesn't roll over from, from year to year. Um, so that's sort of the, the short answer. Thank you, Maggie, appreciate that very much. Your timing was excellent. Is there any more discussion on the motion? Leona. Hi there, just a question. I was looking through the proposed amounts for the grants. I noticed that for the previous grants, previous year's grant versus what we're currently reviewing right now, much of the amount is very similar. Um, are we expecting that the scale of the events will likely be the same as pre-COVID? Um, and then also, because if we are assuming that, does that also mean that a portion of the grant amount is for like a very large fixed cost to host these events? Thank you, Leona. We'll give that to Sherry. Do you want to take that or Maggie? I think that's uh, that's a Sherry question. Thank you. Yeah, certainly um, I can take that one. Um, so when you're looking at the grants and the grant amounts, um, as I previously said, this is three-year funding, so it's a fixed grant amount for a scheduled three-year period. So 2019-20 fiscal year was year one. Last year, 2020-21 was year two. And this year, 2021-22 being the final and third year of this guaranteed, although council approved, um, three-year funding. So the grant amounts did not change. Um, and also they are permitted to have any version, whether it's the in-person, the hybrid or the online as part of this final three-year funding, you know, hosting events during pandemic is extremely difficult. So we are hosting all versions of events this year. Um, does that answer your question? Partially, it's more just a curiosity about hosting events. So I know we've hosted some events that have been before COVID started, and then much of the amount looks very similar for what's currently proposed for 2021, 2022. Um, I guess my question is more so, do we expect that a large portion of the amount is for a fixed cost? And that's why the amount looks very similar from pre-COVID times to the 2020, 2021 year, and then also for the very final year. So the amounts are fixed. So this is pre-approved by council for three-year funding. So the funding does not change from 1920, 19, or 2020, sorry, 2019, 2020, and 2021. They are fixed, approved by council, three-year funding amounts. So pandemic or not, 2021 was already pre-approved in 2019, what that funding amount was gonna be. Okay, so that we are expecting that the scale of all of the events should be pretty similar to what we would have had before, given that the amounts would be the same for three years. Um, event, uh, events, how events are being hosted is variable at this time based on the public, uh, public health restrictions. Um, and that is why we have decided to fund all versions of events. I hope I'm explaining this to you clearly. So if public health does not permit to host a thousand person event, say for an established community festival, and they have to alter their plan somewhat, we will still allow them to use that X amount of grant to have a hybrid event where they host smaller portions of their events or all in person or all, all digital. So, we are working with the event organizers to allow what they can host giving the pandemic restrictions. So that funding amount is 
100% for the event organizer to host some form of, a, of event that the organization can host. Okay. Did that explain? Yeah, I think that answers my question. I think the expectation is that we would host an event that would be comparable to pre-COVID times with the possibility that we would have to adjust based on restrictions. Yes, and that would okay. be up to the organizers to come up with those different forms of events. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Stefan, did I see that you had a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, just briefly, uh, I was happy to see that uh, a lot of the recommended approvals um, based on the, the current pandemic situation uh, were for community organizations to either increase um, their ability to uh, maintain programming uh, virtually um, and also uh, maintain programming um, through uh, outdoor recreation and uh, and and continuing uh, continuing with that. I noticed some of the um, some of the projects that were that were not recommended were also for um, things that would be really good to have. Excuse me, Stefan, are you still on the events? Because in the events motion, there was no one that was declined. Oh, sorry, I, I'm probably addressing the wrong motion then. I think you might be a little ahead of us. I, I, I got excited, sorry. <laughs> That's great. We'll, we'll put you on the list for the next uh, discussion on that. How's that? Thank you. No problem. Um, Emily, I believe I saw your hand next and then Joseph, but. Yeah, so my question is, I wanna make sure I understand this properly. Um, is there just one intake of this for the full year? Um, so why I'm asking that is if we hand out most of the budget today, we're not, we don't have to be conscious of like saving budget to hand out in future meetings throughout the year. So to be clear, I guess this is um, the year three of a three year program that was previously approved by council. So this is, this is specific to those organizations that applied for three year funding. So they would have applied three years ago. There's no intake for this year in this specific motion because it's just for the events. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Joseph. I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, because we are living in the era of, era of COVID, if an event organizer came to us and was like, you know, we, we have to switch from an in-person to a, a virtual event, how much wiggle room do the event organizers have um, to tailor their event to online? Is, are there guidelines that we have in place that, you know, still have the public public's interest with those grant funds that allow an event to be put on that still is in line with what they originally uh, requested it for um like are there guidelines to what they still have to um to use that money for even though it's a virtual event or is it up to the discretion of the actual event organizers thank you for the question joseph and i believe will it be sherry that will answer us again Sure, thank you again, uh, through you chair to the committee member. Um, yes, we are very open this year for organizers to host some form of event. Um, we're not being, we're not setting out certain criteria to change from in-person to online. We're, we're being very upfront with the grant this year. Uh, the grants are being, administer to organizations to host some form of event for the community to enjoy. Um, different, you know, different categories have different criteria when applying and we're, um, I guess, easing up on those restrictions. So, um, you know, free to the public to enjoy, um, just bring some positivity to our, our residents, to our communities. It's been a tough year. Uh, that's why we said from the very beginning, all three forms of events, we're open to allowing all virtual to happen if you cannot host an in-person or a mixture of in-between with a hybrid event as well. Thank you, okay. Sherry. Joseph, does that answer your question? Uh, it it, it kind of does, but I, I'm more so looking to see if there, do we have any form of guideline in place that says, you know, if you are going to be putting on a live event and you have to 100% transition to a virtual event, 
what is in place that still has to meet the expectations? You know, do we have any any um, anything formally actually set in place that says that you know if X Y Z was supposed to happen in in live, does X Y Z still have to happen virtually? Like, are there still any obligations that they still have to to meet to going live or uh, going virtual rather than live? And what is to hold them to those? What, what's to kind of hold event organizers to um, that commitment? Because we are, of course, using our own public funds to put on events for communities, and we still have to ensure that these events are going to be for community-minded individuals. So, in my mind, is what do we have in place that says that uh, you know, yes, you're going from live to virtual, and you know, but you still have to meet these criteria if you're going to be doing that. Thank you, Joseph. Sherry. Sure. Certainly, thank you again. Um, we do keep in constant contact with all event organizers. Um, so to date, we have reached out to all um, and have their 2021 20, dates listed. And as previously mentioned, the majority, if not all, are hosting some form of an in-person event other than it is now four that have canceled altogether. Um, once this report is finalized through council, we will be reaching out again to all organizers um, to have the conversations of still moving forward with such and such event date. Um, and we will finalize their event plans when the agreement is signed. So doing our due diligence prior to releasing the grant that the event is still happening as previous discussions between HRM and the organizers have taken place. So, and as for the criteria with um, online, like I said, we're, we're, we're very open this year for the third and final year of funding. Um, if an event takes place for the enjoyment of the community, we are willing to fund 100% virtual I don't think very many are going 100% virtual in this report. Most, if not all, are having some form of an in-person event. Thank you, Sherry. And I'm sure that any organization would be subject to any uh, public health guidelines and uh, protocols that they needed to adhere to as well. But I see Maggie has unmuted, so uh, you might have just, something else that you can uh, share with us. Just to add to what Sherry is saying, it's, it's less about a formal criteria around um, virtual events, as opposed to, as Sherry describes, the conversation with event organizers to ensure that the public is still getting the, the benefit of, of those events. Um, but, uh, but certainly, as she points out, what we're seeing is that the, the preference is, if possible, to go, to go in person. Thank you very much. Wonderful discussion. Thank you. Any more comments? Oh. Yes, Maggie. Can I just add one qualification to my earlier answer? My apologies. There is a, a component of the, um, the grant program that's based on, on reserves. And so reserves do carry forward from, from year to year. Uh, the, the balance of the funding is, is operational. And, and so that earlier answer stands, but I did just want to qualify that the, the cultural programs are funded through reserves. So that, that money does carry forward. Thank you very much, Maggie. No more discussion. Is there a call for the question? Question. Thank you, Lindell. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. Hearing none, our motion is carried. Thank you. So moving on to the next item on our agenda is 9.1.4, 2021-22, Rural Transit Funding Program. We're supported by Patricia Hughes. I'm not sure, yeah, Patricia is here. And so would someone care to put the motion on the floor and to read it, please? I will. Thank you, Trish. I move that it is recommended that the HRM Grants Committee recommend to Regional Council that Regional Council approve grants pursuant to the Rural Transit grants administrative order for the 2021-22 fiscal year to a maximum of $470,000 as such grants are set forth in table two of this report. 
Thank you. Is there a seconder, please? I'll second. Thank you, Stefan. Any discussion on this motion? We had a lovely report. I, I have a question. Yes, thank you, Alex. Um, how come we're funding the East Hants area? Because they provide support within the Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, but, oh, Patricia's just here. So thank you, Patricia, you can answer. Thanks, good morning, Patricia Hughes. I'm the Director of Planning and Customer Engagement at Halifax Transit. Yes, we only fund the in-service kilometers within HRM to HRM residents. So we have quite a few, you know, you may live in Fall River and uh, have a doctor or a dentist or, or, or uh, an appointment in Elmsdale, for example. So we'll fund the, uh, the HRM portions of it. I thought so, thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? Hearing none, we'll call for the question. Question. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. Hearing none, our motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, and my apologies. Um, Earlier, Sherry, I should have said thank you very much for answering all of our questions on the previous motion. We really appreciate your work. Thank you. So now we're at 9.1.5, which is the Interim Community Museums Grant Program, Recommended Awards 2021. And on this conversation, we are supported by Petra Jane Temple. So may I have uh, someone to put the motion on the floor and to read it out, please? I will. Thank you, Trish. I move that it is recommended that the Grants Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council 1 approve five project grants as set out in Table 1 of the discussion section of this report at a combined cost of 58500 in fiscal year 2021-22 from operating account M310-8004 and to approve a two-year extension to the service agreement with the Association of Nova Scotia Museums at a total cost of 24,000 from operating account M310-8001 and three, authorize the Executive Director of Finance and Asset Management to negotiate and execute an amending agreement for a two-year extension to the service agreement with the Association of Nova Scotia Museums. Thank you very much. Is there a seconder for that? Thank you, Joseph. Any discussion on the motion? Love our museums. We have great local museums uh, and a provincial museums in the HRM. So no discussion? I, I will. Oh, thank you, Trish. I just want to take this opportunity to just shout out to our Cole Harbor Heritage Farm Museum here, uh, still operating this farm in a very urban setting, uh, used to be very rural and agricultural here. So uh, we're just very thankful to have it still running and very thankful for this program to, to offer funding to help keep it up and keep it in good condition. So thanks. Thank you very much, Trish. Leona, yes. Hi there, more so just a question because I saw that the Atlantic Canadian Aviation Museum was not um, recommended for funding. And there is a note there that um, possible alternative funding sources would be um, suggested, I guess, to the museum. Out of curiosity, what would those alternative funding sources be? And I believe we have uh, PJ Temple to answer us on that one. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, um, for you to the community. Uh, we're going to have to do a little research and we will lean on our colleagues, perhaps, in um, the Association Museums. But given that the building itself is owned by the provincial government, there may be sources there. Um, the second point is there have been some discussions around relocating that museum to another site. So 
I would anticipate that we would be in touch with the applicant, A, to look at is there a plan for relocating, which could change uh, the nature of any capital improvements they make to the existing facility. Um, but secondly, we would certainly as staff look at potential alternate funding sources. Okay. I think that's great. Uh, it's one of those museums that my husband and I have taken our children to on the way to the airport in previous years, and it's a museum that we, we really quite enjoy. So I was sad that it wasn't recommended mm -hmm. for funding, but if it is relocated, perhaps somewhere closer or more accessible to the public, I think that would be a great opportunity. Madam Chair, if I may, I, I would add to that, um, that Aviation Museum is actually the first to date to get the uh, provincial accreditation which is a provincial program delivered through the Association of Nova Scotia Museums. So um, I wish to impress upon you, this is nothing to do with the nature of their programming or the quality of their programming. Uh, they simply don't own that particular building. They do own the larger hangar alongside. So that's the rationale to the climb. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, PJ. Thank you, Leona. Shall we call for the question? Question. Alex, are you calling for the question or? Yes, 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 question. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Hearing none, the motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. Uh, heads up, the next one is a good one for you. So 9.1.6. HRM Community Grants, Physical Year 2021, the recommended awards motion. May I have someone uh, put the motion on the floor? And again, we will be supported uh, in answering our questions by PJ Temple. So I looked down, did someone say that they wanted to put the motion on the floor? Sorry about that. I will. Alex, thank you very much, Alex. Okay, um, it is recommended that the Grants Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council approve 61 awards as detailed in attachment two of this report for a compound total of $479,646 from operating account M311-8004 community grants. Thank you, may I have a seconder? I think I saw Stefan. And so discussion on the motion, if, uh, if we could, because I've only got the one screen, if we do uh, raised hands or Jill, if they're using the chat function, maybe you can help me figure out who's first, second and third, how's that? So Leona, I think I saw your hand raised, but uh, there, there is no, a motion. No question for me, I was just gonna second the motion to start. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll there. go. So. Who's first for the discussion or any questions? I believe, uh, Stefan, you had started the conversation and I have you first on the list for this one. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I noticed there's some great projects that were not recommended um, because the application was incomplete uh, in terms of financial information, uh, the failure to include, include financial information. Um, could we get, an idea maybe for my own edification um what how what that's how that situation plays out is there is there a conversation that happens be, between the applicant um and the municipality uh if that information is incomplete um and maybe an idea of what uh is there is there a trend in uh in in, in something in a common common thing that is uh, that makes a financial application incomplete Thank you, Stefan. PJ. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in terms of the sort of discussion with the applicant, um, typically not. And now the reason for that is because um, it would be unfair to those applicants um, to be given a second chance to complete their submission, particularly when most, the vast majority of these applications probably arrive March 28th, most on the 31st. So from a practical point of view, to give them a chance to, to make up an incomplete application, 
Um, secondly, you could get into a, a gray zone if you were only permitting someone to change an application for financial information. Would you also give them a chance to, oh, we've changed our mind, we don't want bricks, we'd like ceiling tiles, whatever. So the, I think for the second, is there a trend? Um, generally not. It, it's not as if incomplete information is coming only from groups that are volunteer-led. Um, you see incomplete submissions from large groups with large budgets and paid staff. So, in our experience, the submissions that come from groups that are entirely volunteer are typically on part of those from, from paid staff. So, it, it's not a, uh, is that a failing of theirs? One of the things that you will see a big difference is the complexity or the simplicity of the financial information. Um, really, we're not looking for audited financial statements. That would be cost prohibitive and, uh, and quite frankly, unnecessary for some of the small groups. Um, in terms of what recourse for those that are declined, we do have a process called a referral of counsel. It's not technically an appeal for legal services that has a different connotation, but the committee could, or regional council could, ask that uh, an application that recommended decline be referred back to staff for further review. And typically, that would be a decision of regional council, and whether there's one or there's ten, we would take a second look at those applications within the context of the budget remaining. Um, it is helpful if there is a referral to give a rationale as to why. Uh, that if I can look at exactly the same information, why would we expect a very different result? So. In the case, for example, if the committee or council wanted to refer an application back based on it being incomplete, the financial information was missing, um, Madam Chair, we're not allowed to make motions on the fly as staff, but I would ask that consideration be given to qualify that. So, for example, it may be conditional upon that missing information being submitted within X time frame. And that way, you don't hold all the recommended awards up for the sake of one or two. So it would, it would have to be clear the rest of them go forward, um, and then regional council can agree or disagree uh, with a further referral. So basically what happens, they approve X number, and we proceed forward with the issuance of those funds. Any that come back as a referral, Staff would then write a supplementary report that would come back to you and then on to regional council for a decision. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. Joseph, you're Any next. Case, now, in regards to uh, applicants being declined based on incomplete financial information, how do we indicate to them that? that was the cause and what support or resources do we provide applicants for future out for future submissions on how to better their applications when applying so for you madam chair um once council has rendered its decision awards not recommended and uh, ineligible every applicant will receive a letter of notification from grants and contributions with council's decision and with that comes a rationale as to why. So to the second point of your question, I think to me there's a distinction between they had a financial statement of whatever format it is and did not include that with their submission. So the submission itself is incomplete. Um, we're, we're not judging the presentation of that financial information. So that's an important distinction because we'll have some volunteer groups, for example, um, who have very limited revenues, but their financial reporting can be very detailed. Cash in hand, an itemized source of revenues, we made $200 from pickle sales, and we made $100 from 50-50, and then they'll have very itemized expenditures. So we're not here to judge them on accounting principles. It really is the First issue, 
you have to submit the financial information. And most that you see that were declined on that basis did not submit anything. There was one that submitted, I think it was a cash flow projection for 2020. The criteria is that they submit a financial information for the prior fiscal year. So that type of individual feedback would be provided to each and every applicant. And I think that's important for a developmental program, as opposed to I regret to advise you decline. Otherwise, if you don't provide that kind of feedback, there's the risk that they would repeat that same mistake. And individual feedback is, is provided at their request too. So if, if they're looking for further detail, uh, typically that would be Peter Griffin that would provide that assistance go forward. Right. That, that, that was my bigger my bigger concern was, you know, if we have applicants or community groups coming towards us and asking us for community support and putting on events and we're rejecting them based off of even their experience in filling out applications can be challenging to some individuals depending on you know their mm -hmm. their uh, backgrounds so in, in my mind is what are we doing to encourage these individuals to reapply and providing them the necessary support or feedback if, if necessary I agreed and i think again that's characteristic of a developmental program it's also why Peter Griffin's title is community developer, not an administrative support. Uh, and the key is to provide constructive feedback to the group so that they don't reapply if they're ineligible on you know, the nature of uh, the project, that's wasting their time, but also that if they have some understanding of what was missing or what was unclear, then they can work on that and resubmit the following year. Thank you, PJ. Joseph, do you feel like your answer you have been answered? It was, yes, thank you. I think Alex had his hand up there. Yes, I'm just getting ready to go to Alex next. Thank you. I'm next, okay. Thank you. Um, I know this was this was one of the reports that didn't um, uh, dispense its entire budget. There was a, um, a few dollars left over. Yet when I, I go through each of the uh, uh, the applicants, most of them are fully funded uh, as per their requests, but there are a few that aren't fully funded. Um, and I'm just mm -hmm. wondering why, for, for example, number number 16, Club Inclusion, the, uh, the requested uh, 3,945, and, and we have uh, recommended 3,500. Um, some of them are only, you know, 40 cents short of what they've requested, but why, for example, is this one uh, so much less than what they have requested? Thank you, PJ, that goes to you. Did you say it was 34, Alex? Uh, it was, um, no, item number 16, club 16. inclusion. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, we could certainly look at the at the file for that and get back to the separate copy by email, but typically, um, if we have not given the full amount that was requested, it may be that there is a, an expenditure embedded within that request um, that we wouldn't fund. So for example, you will sometimes see people include, let's say the cost of the equipment, and then there's something called administration. You know, they have included part of their recurring annual operating budget within their overall budget. Uh, we don't interpret that to be misleading. We acknowledge there are some expenditures on their part, but that doesn't form part of the grant itself. So in this particular case, we're funding the purchase of that equipment. I, I, uh, in other, oh, sorry, in other, no. it may be a larger project and there may be some elements of it that are ineligible for funding. So we'll focus the recommendation on those elements that are eligible. And um, in those cases, you might see an explanation, we've exclu excluded overhead. I'm thinking why the, YWCA application, I, I think there's a, a clear, we have excluded administrative overhead. Um, so we try to make it clear in that, in that fashion. I, Madam Chair, I, I understand and agree completely with that. However, it is not mentioned in, in each of the um, responses from uh, City Hall. And I think it would be helpful 
A, to the committee and B, to the, the general public, other applicants, to know in, uh, because they're reading these, uh, what, mm -hmm. is, what is being excluded and why. I think that would be okay. helpful. Okay, certainly. So PJ, is that possible that the report could include the reasons for the exclusions or is there any issue of confidentiality that uh, would prohibit us from being able to do that? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't see any reason for us not to add that additional refinement to future reports. Um, in terms of confidentiality, I think the nature of what we deal with, it's all in the public domain. If you're a non-profit or a registered yep. charity, your financial statements are in the public domain. Um, it, we're not dealing with private corporations. Uh, so you. I have no issue. I don't anticipate any. Yeah. Thank you. That was a very nice point, Alex. Thank you. Are there any other questions, discussion on this motion? Hearing none, will we call for the question? I just need somebody to call for the question. I will Alex. call the question. Oh, yeah. Alex, thanks. Thanks, Lindell. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Hearing none, our motion is carried. Thank you, and thank you very much, PJ. So. Um, just our, our little takeaway from that, though, is that uh, when we see this report, we will have a, a clear reason for why any portion was uh, exempted. So that would be awesome. Thank you very much. Yes. Our next item is added items. Do we have any added items to the agenda? Didn't see any when we approved it. So the date of our next meeting is July 12th, 2021. Before we ask for a call for adjournment, I must say thank you all for a really robust meeting and excellent questions and conversation and discussion so that we do our best job possible. We really appreciate it. Uh, supporting the nonprofit sector in HRM is one of the most valuable things that we do that supports community and grassroots community where a lot of solutions are found. So thank you very much. And may I have a call for adjournment? Call call. Thank you, Joseph. We are so adjourned at 11.05. Have a beautiful day, everyone.